All right, our next speaker is Ben Green, who many of you know as Numtel on GitHub. Ben has been working on reactive SQL implementations for Meteor. He first presented a MySQL proof of concept in December, and tonight he will be presenting his reactive Postgres project. Ben spent many years as a PHP program, as a PHP programmer, had an enlightening stint as a Python engineer, and now has 13 Meteor packages published on Atmosphere. Everyone, please welcome Ben. <clears throat> hey, how's it going? Let's see. So I'm going to start this presentation with uh, a load test that we're going to see the results of at the end of the presentation. Um, I'm going to do a simple test here that does, it's kind of a unit test on the query that has to be performed to refresh a result set. And this is going to run in two different uh, modes. It's going to do one mode with a uh, 380 rows per result set, and it's going to do one with 400. And they're going to each, each going to run for five minutes. So in 10 minutes, we'll see what the difference is in that case, and we'll get some nice graphs going here. So there's the command, and uh, it's running. We'll get to the slides. OK. This uh, talk is called Meteor Beyond Mongo, a look at reactive Postgres SQL. So. I wanted to start out with the history of reactive Postgres SQL. Um, about, I guess, more than 10 years ago now, there was this project out of Berkeley. Um, they've got this Telegraph CQ continuous query. They put a ton of work into making Postgres work so that you can run many queries continuously by changing the internal structure of Postgres to actually facilitate these things. But the work they did isn't really quite the exact same what we're looking for with Meteor. It doesn't, it's not so much that you get new results when the data changes, it's more you get new results at a certain scheduled time frame. So this example here is from their paper that they have up on their website that you can find. And it, uh, it's just a normal SQL query, but then they add a section here on the bottom that'll get new results for, like it says here, each day for up to a thousand days. And so this is, this is kind of something that had been done in the past that I had found, um, but it really, it doesn't quite lead to the reactive SQL that we're looking for where you get new changes or you get the data as soon as it changes. So um, in the last few months, I've been working on a Postgres package that uses this awesome feature of Postgres called Listen and Notify. Um, unlike MySQL, you can get actual instantaneous notifications to your client without pulling the database at all using the, the system. Um, first, you do a listen query, and then when you do the notify query, you get these responses. So the first output there is just from the command line Postgres client. And then the bottom is how you would do that in JavaScript using the node Postgres driver. And you can see it, it has an event emitter on the client that you just get an event from, and then you can read your payload. It's a string that you can deal with. Um, this is very similar to how we do it in uh, my node Postgres package. Um, it's a little bit different implementation just due to the way callbacks change into promises and things like that. But there is, there is issues with this. Um, these notifications, in order to get them to come out of your database, you've got to put them in triggers on your tables. And putting triggers on a table creates a lock. So you get a lot of clients, a lot of activity. You're going to end up with certain slowdowns, as well as the fact that they're limited to 8,000 bytes. So right now, the package, if your row size is greater than 8,000 bytes, your row changes, you've got you know maybe a whole article in there, it'll actually page that apart, and you'll get multiple notifications. So you'll, it's seamless for you, but it's just slower. So hopefully, we can figure out some way to fix that. Um, the package works in Postgres 9.3, but in Postgres 9.4, there's actually a new feature they're coming out with called logical decoding. And this has not been implemented yet, but as you can see from this example that's up on the Postgres website, it gives you very specific data, just exactly like the uh, MySQL binary log would give you for Postgres. And it's, it would be extremely easy to implement this um, as long as you're running Postgres 9.4. Um, and thanks to Justin Santa Barbara for introducing me to that. And as you can see, no table locks required. You just get the data. Very awesome. Um, 
So right now, in order to get any updates to the queries, you're going to have to repeatedly run the query. And this can really add up when you get a lot of changes. You get multiple or hundreds of changes per second on a query, potentially. Um, so one of the things that I put a couple weeks of time into was actually looking into seeing if you could refresh queries without refreshing. And I got the nice Wheelerism up there. Um, I've got the simple queries branch, if you look on my PG Live Select package, which is the package that runs the Meteor package. And it does work, but in order to do all that sort of figuring out the diff between the result sets and figuring out if the changing or if the incoming row matches your queries, it really puts a lot of strain on your JavaScript. And due to the single-threaded nature of Node.js, you just end up with huge blocks of your event loop. And it really slows down the activities and your response times when you get lots of, or when you get lots of changes. So I didn't include it in the release. Um, potentially, you could do some sort of process management where you'd have, say, a fork of your main process running so that these things could be run asynchronously. But realistically, there's probably better solutions um, because you are really limited on what queries you can run. Basically, you know, data from one table, no joins, and no aggregates. So you, you would end up having to move a lot of logic in your application, which the whole reason you're using SQL is so that you can do that in the database. Um, so that's kind of the different approaches that I've tried, or the, the, I guess not the logical decoding, but the different approaches that are kind of aware of due to, the, or at this point in development. Um, this is the simplest example that you'd be able to publish a query from on out of your Meteor application. And you'll notice this is much simpler than anything that you would have been able to do with my MySQL package, because one of the features of this Postgres package, it will determine which tables are dependent, or which tables this query is dependent on, and automatically place um, in validation function so that anything changes on those tables, it'll refresh the query. So if you omit them, you'll get a working live query, but it might be inefficient because you'll be refreshing more than you could potentially have to. But like with a query like this, where you're actually getting all the data from the table, there's no where clause, it doesn't make a difference. So you might as well do this. Um, you get a little bit more complicated. We have this query, which has a uh, where clause, and it's got a parameter on there so that it only loads a score for a specific ID. And you'll see even the difference between these uh, data invalidation functions and the ones from my MySQL package. It's a little bit simpler. Um, you can just specify an object. And then for the keys of the objects, you put the table name. And you only have to deal with one argument, the row. In my MySQL package, you had to deal with the current row. And then if there's a new row on an update, but in this, it's actually simpler. If it's an update, it'll run this invalidation function twice. And if either of them match, it'll update the result set. That way, you don't have to deal with just an enormous uh, Boolean operation to determine if you've got it just kind of a little bit more efficient for your development. And um, so we've got some practical features which have been added. And these are um, also on the MySQL package. And they've kind of come from other people. Um, the first one here, we've got the change method on your subscriptions. So if, say, you're doing um, an infinite scroll or just even changing pages, you can change the arguments on your publication during runtime and not have to create a new subscription and then change your object over. You can actually do this without any kind of flickering on your front end. It's really nice. And that's thanks to Andy CJW, maybe an issue on the GitHub repo on MySQL. It, uh, it's on Postgres as well. Um, the code base is shared. so. All the features, hopefully, I'll get across both. Um, next one, um, clean up on hot code push. As we all know, Meter has awesome hot code pushes. But if you're connecting to a database that isn't integrated as well as Mongo is, you end up with certain things building up. Um, in Postgres, it has to build triggers and functions. And those have to be rebuilt when you um, reload your application. So this is up on the readme. and. It's, it's just real simple. You just do this, and then once the promise returns, you can exit the process, and then your program will restart. Um, and that's thanks to Krishna PG. Can't even up with the issue on that one. 
And uh, last but not least, we've got Nothing Is Dead came up with this awesome performance improvement, um, something that has not been implemented on my MySQL package yet, but in our tests have shown more than um, double speed improvement when you um, don't return every row result on an update. You only return the rows that you don't know about by sending the hashes that you do know about. And just the, the less data that you have to send from the Postgres server to the Meteor server is a significant improvement. And awesome, great. Th thank you, Bob, for that feature. Um, so the kind of the future of this package is, I mean, there's definitely a lot of problems with it. If you start putting lots of data in, you get lots of requests, it's going to slow down. And I've been doing a lot of load tests to try and figure that out. Um, I guess the first point is unrelated to that is I came up with a uh, server integration for MySQL. And getting that working with Postgres is really no problem. I just haven't had the time to do it yet. So that'll be really awesome. You'll just be able to type Meteor add PG server. And you won't have to have an external Postgres server running. You'll be able to get up and running as easy as you can with Mongo. It'll start when you start your Meteor program. It'll exit when you exit your Meteor program. Um, that's definitely a great way to get started with using SQL. Um, this next point is something that's more kind of a moonshot, kind of I'm not sure if I would ever actually make it happen because of that third point. Um, Postgres's explain command output is extremely detailed, um, a lot more so than MySQL's. And you could potentially use this breakdown, and you can even get it in JSON format, to automatically write the invalidation functions that you would have to write manually like I had in the previous slide. And it's not a direct translation, and there's a lot to comprehend to make sure that you have a full solution. But it'd be really awesome if we didn't have to write those, because it's kind of a pain. But the third point, Google Love Field, I found this project. Um, it's written by a guy at Google, um, Demetrius Papadopoulos. Um, he's got an awesome talk on the repo on GitHub about this client-side SQL-like query engine that um, has observers on the queries. So you're able to get basically the exact same thing that the PG Live Select package does, except it's built into the query engine so that you get a notification when the data on the query changes and it's just built in. And this would provide latency compensation built in just like MiniMongo has, and as well as latency compensation between queries, which right now doing with this package is, is definitely a, a bear. You're going to have a tough time getting multiple queries to latency compensate between themselves. And this package, it's still in development, um, especially the observers. The performance is not what it needs to be to be able to use it at a large scale. But I'm definitely looking into that. Um, hopefully, I can make it work. And hopefully, Demetrius has a lot of things up his sleeve as well. Um, so the last point is wrangling the memory usage, which looks like the test's completed at this point. Um, let's start with the first one. So this is a, these two graphs here, the top is the heap total of the memory usage, and the bottom is the heap used. So you'll see the most important numbers here on the left, like we max out at, what's that, 100, and the bottom here is 79. So that's heap total, and the heap used is, what's that, 49 and 27. So when the result set is only 380 rows, which is still quite a bit, the memory is just flat. This will, you can run this out. When, it, it, when you run it up to like 15 minutes, it does increase a little bit, but not significantly. And you'll see it's, it's basically flat. That's what you want to see on a memory test is that you have flat results. But one thing that's extremely anomalous that I've found is when you bump that result set up to 400 rows, not a significant change. Um, you'll see a completely different memory profile. The numbers on the left here on the y-axis, what's that, 790 on the heap total and 672 on the heap used? And you see those extreme spikes. Um, these kind of things seem inherent to the node Postgres driver that I'm using to build this package. So when you have long result sets, these memory leaks are just an extreme problem. In lots of cases, if you had you know, a few hundred operations per second, you're going to see the server kind of crashing 
in less than an hour. So it's really important, especially at this point in time, if you're going to try and use this Postgres package, to make sure that you keep your result sets as small as possible. Um, especially like with using the change method, paginate your data so that you're not getting you know huge result sets coming through because it'll cause this. I've been looking at this. I'm still looking at this. Um, it's really just spending a lot of time looking through graphs and trying to figure out how to make the application more performant. Um, anybody who'd like to help on it, I've got an issue up on the package. Um, try and keep as much information as I can up there. But hopefully, um, Google Upfield is going to be a whole new generation, a whole new zeitgeist on how to use SQL reactively. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, you can definitely use joins. Um, can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, the question was, my examples did not show any joins in the queries. Um, whether and um, can you use joins? And basically, yes, the examples were short. That way, they'd fit on a slide. Using a join, you definitely have a lot more complexity. Um, I've got an example up. If you go to the repository, there's a link for how to publish efficient join queries. And it gives you a full meteor.publish example of how to do it over three tables. Basically, you're going to end up having supporting queries. So you have a supporting active query, and then you keep records of which IDs are going to be used to refresh to update your validation functions for the main query. And so it can quickly snowball into something where you'd have a lot of tables. You might have a couple of supporting queries. And you can contain these all in a publish function. But writing these is something that is a mental exercise beyond just writing a query, as well as there might be significant things that you could do with your application logic be, be, or beyond even just you know whether these data changes, you could put timers in there, you could do whatever you need to. It's, yeah, it's a complicated task. It's not straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, can you work with the paginated result sets? So when your result set is huge, mm -hmm. Yeah, the question was, can you work with paginated result sets? And yes, that's um, the change method that Andy CJW um, requested is what you'd use to that. You would have, say you'd put a limit and an offset. So you'd have a limit argument on your publication. And then you'd use the change method to, per, or your, you'd have an argument that would be like the page. And then you'd do change, and you'd give a new value to that argument, and it'll reinitialize the subscription and give you new data. It without, um, you'd, you wouldn't have to change anything on your templates or anything. Mm -hmm. um, so you showed example with the with just select statement. Is it correct that I can use actually anything um, on post some function, some storage procedure? Am I correct? Yeah, the question was, can you use any Postgres feature with these select statements? And yes, that was, yes, you can. That is one of the key points of this approach, is you're not required to have primary keys, anything like that. You can use any Postgres feature. You install a Postgres extension. You can use JSON features. You can use whatever you want. But coming with that amazing possibilities is the price of having to pay to rerun these queries all the time. So it's kind of a trade-off. We have time for one more question. If anyone wants to be the lucky person. <laughs> no more questions? All right. Thanks All right. so much, Ben. Thank you.